So this is our third lesson on Europe, the European transformations during the Renaissance. And in this period, we're going to look at the Enlightenment, specifically uh, aspects of the Enlightenment, such as the early scientific revolution and the Industrial Revolution, the, the early part of the Industrial Revolution, uh, political changes, and the Enlightenment itself. So first, let's take a look at the early scientific revolution. Um, and I thought we'd just do a rundown of the major figures of this time period so you can get a sense overall of what the major scientists from this period were doing. So first was Nicholas Copernicus who you know, made the claim that the earth rotated around the sun. Johannes Kepler um, who discovered further principles of planetary motion and made some major advancements in mathematics. Galileo Galilei who developed the telescope and further mathematics and did a lot of work with planetary motion as well. Rene Descartes, who gives us the Cartesian coordinates that we use when we're graphing in math class, as well as a lot of the philosophy of science, such as skepticism and empiricism. Basically, the idea that every scientific idea should be viewed skeptically until it's proven, and that the proof should be available for anyone, and anybody should be able to do a scientific experiment to demonstrate that a scientific idea is in fact true. Uh, Francis Bacon, uh, who also contributed to the philosophy of science, and Isaac Newton, who came up with the theory of uh, universal gravitation, um, calculus, and laws of motion, which you've probably studied in science class. And the early scientific revolution really set off a struggle between faith in things unseen and reason about what can be seen and logically deduced. And this is an old conflict in Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and other world religions, right? I mean, religion is based on things you can't see. Um, you know, people claim that God talks to them, but there's no way to actually prove that. Um, you know, remember we go back to, you know, Rene Descartes' ideas that if it's to be empirically provable, then everybody has to be able to see it and everybody has to be able to hear it and know about it. Religion's just not that way. I mean, God only spoke to Muhammad. God only spoke to Jesus. God didn't speak to every person, um, at least in those religions way of looking at things. And so, you know, this set off a big struggle. Um, and, you know, science and the scientific method just made this conflict worse. Also, Europeans gained more control over the natural world, um, economic production, the human body, military technology. And this led to an upward spiral in wealth and military superiority relative to other great world civilizations, right? I mean, remember what we are going to do with this project. We're kind of trying to figure out why Europe became so much richer and more powerful than other parts of the world at this time period, especially since they weren't starting with any kind of advantage. And, you know, the scientific revolution was a big change that led to that. You know, science gives us better guns and that makes us more powerful. Um, but, you know, science is transmissible, right? Scientific ideas can go from England to India. Scientific ideas can go from China to Europe, as we've seen. So, um, you know, part of what we're looking at in our day and age is now that, you know, most of the world has experienced the scientific revolution, um, you know, things are changing in the world right now. And so the scientific revolution also brings about, you know, the early industrial revolution. Um, you know, during the medieval period, man, a lot of early manufacturing was done by guilds. So you had a guild of bakers, you had a guild of weavers who weaved cloth. And these were specialized laborers who often lived and worked in specific cities and locations so that a, a city might become known for its cloth or for its wine or for its candles or something like that. Um, over time though, people started to set up, you know, manufacturing in their homes. So a family might specialize in weaving or candle making. Um, and this kind of weakened the guilds in a lot of European cities. Um, also at this time period, people began to have specialized farming practices. So farmers instead, uh, and they started to, you know, do what we call monocrop farming. Now mono is one, 
right? And so the monocrop farming is where, you know, a farmer will only plant potatoes or will only plant um, chilies or something like that. Um, very different from traditional farming where a farm kind of grew a little bit of everything and grew enough to support the family of the farmer plus a little bit extra to sell. You know, this time period you start to get more specialized farming. Um, and again, this is just early industrialism, early mass production where groups of people will produce just a ton of one kind of thing, whether it's food or cloth or something else like that. Um, this was a major change in the European economy. And some of this started to bring about a shift in European economic classes. Um, as we saw in a previous lesson, banking uh, becomes big at this time period. And banking is important because it shifts economic power towards bankers and merchants. Right? Traditionally, the basis of wealth is land. If you have land, you can grow food, you can generate crop surpluses, you make money off the land. Um, you know, and so knights and dukes and barons were people who had land. That's what made them rich and powerful. But, you know, starting in the Enlightenment period, those with money start to become much more powerful and they start to threaten traditional aristocrats. Um, and, and the basis of, of like wealth, as I said, becomes money. And this is important. I mean, money is portable. You can't move land, but you can move money. And so merchants and early manufacturers became much more wealthy and connected and politically powerful. This period was also kind of the end of, you know, the great period of kings. And, um, you know, two kings especially, you know, James I and uh, Louis XVI here were kind of the last kings to give us this idea of absolutism. And absolutism is kind of an answer to what gives someone the right to be king, right? Why does this guy get to be king? You know, traditional, traditionally, um, you know, kings are kings because God wants them to be king. And these traditional ideas of divinely, God, you know, God-given kingship, these go back to Babylon and Sumer. I mean, these are some of the most ancient ideas about political power and political legitimacy in human history. Um, but, uh, you know, starting in the Renaissance, you know, democracy starts to come into European ideas. Um, Europe starts to get much more respect for individuals. Um, and this becomes threatening to kings, as you could imagine. If suddenly, you know, more people's opinions matter and people start to feel that they should have a say in government, um, this is threatening. And so, you know, the answer here was absolutism. You know, and French kings, uh, the Elizabeth Stuarts, the Spanish kings, and the Catholic Church really supported these absolutist ideas of you know kings being kings because God wants them to be king uh, and that kings you know should be above parliaments or the rule of law but you know democracy was not to be stopped right uh, in an earlier lesson we looked at the Magna Carta which was written in 1215 which established an early version of the English Parliament basically um, this was a group of noblemen, you know, dukes and barons and such, who had the power to veto new taxes, had the power to stop kings from, you know, English kings from doing certain things. Um, you know, on the continent, there were councils of nobles or aristocrats in other feudal European kingdoms. Um, you know, and again, these councils of nobles could stop kings from doing things. And you can imagine how this was a threat to kings and why, you know, absolutism would be such a, an, a, an attractive idea to these European kings. You know, God tells me I'm king and so I can do whatever I want. Um, but this was the period in which the, the parliaments and the councils of nobles were going to turn the tide. And Europe, European civilization would become more democratic. Now, we should remember this didn't give power to commoners and peasants, you know, normal people like you and I, um, but it was an important first step towards the democracy that we enjoy today. Um, so like I said, you know, European parliaments gained more power, 
and the Reformation weakened absolutist ideas as well. You know, this revolution in the church that weakened the Catholic Church kind of spilled over into larger politics and culture, right? If, you know, you can topple God's own Pope on earth, what's a king at that point? King's nothing compared to, you know, to God and the Pope. Um, you know, this really reached an important climax during the English Civil War. And this was during the 1640s to 1660s. Um, you know, par the English Parliament got together and executed Charles I. And this was a huge move, right? Charles I's dad was James I, this big absolutist king. Well, if kings are kings because God wants them to be king, and all of a sudden they kill the king. Um, you can see how this completely it, it changes everybody's view of things and is a, a reflection of these new ideas. Um, you know, and so we get this pattern of changes of laws in these European states and in some of their American colonies like, you know, what would become the United States. And so you can see kind of a list of major turning points here in the moves towards democracy as well as these ideas of limited government, right? Traditional monarchy was unlimited government. If the king said it, it was law and it was going to happen. Same for sultans or caliphs or Chinese emperors. Whatever they said, was that's what was going to happen. Um, but under a limited government and the rights of the individual and the rule of law, right? This idea that um, the law is abo above everyone, even the king. These were major changes that would set the stage towards again, the kind of democracy that we live in today. Um, you know, it's kind of hard for me to talk about this part of history without bias, right? I'm an American and I believe in the American system of government. You know, I believe people should be able to choose their leaders. I believe people should make decisions about how to run their economic lives and the economic life of the nation. And, and I don't believe that aristocracies and kings are the ways it should be. Um, you know, so this is an exciting era for me as an American because this really sets the stage for, you know, what would become this country that, it, that I really enjoy living in. Um, but, you know, you have to appreciate where this came from, the, the fall of absolutism, the reformation, the, the slow march of democracy, um, you know, it all sets the stage for um, what was to come. And we have to really ask ourselves, you know, what's more important here, the individual or the group? You know, this classic, you know, Greco-Roman statue here, you know, shows individualism, right? Individualism is the belief that the individual and his rights and freedoms and powers, his ability to choose his own identity and lifestyle, that this is important, right? And you know the roots of this. We talked about this in Project 2. Um, you know, so I want you to contrast this with traditional aristocracies and royalist politics that says, you know, the king matters more than everyone, or the, you know, whatever the emperor says goes, and you know, the king and the em or the emperor have to decide what's good for everyone. Um, you know, as we move towards individualism, it's what's good for each individual, and that was that was a big change in European culture. Um, so let's turn our attention now to the Enlightenment itself. And we should consider the word, right? To be enlightened is to kind of have the life inside of yourself. I'm sorry, the light. To have the light inside of yourself. And this is a very individualistic idea, right? That, you know, people are now enlightened. And it's kind of a catch-all term for everything you've seen so far, right? This individualism, the growth of democracy, the scientific revolution, the demands for reason and science over faith and superstition, uh, ideas of freedom and liber liberty. This is all part of the enlightenment. And you probably recognize all these things as being a part of your culture um, and a part of the culture of the United States. And we really have to ask ourselves if this has made the world a better place. I mean, I think it has. But you don't have to agree with me, you know. Um, so again, look at that list of that, you know, the Enlightenment there, and ask yourself: Has the Enlightenment made the world a better place? You know, uh, the Enlightenment led to the American and French revolutions, and we'll talk a little bit about both these projects at the beginning of Project Five. And of course, we'll talk a lot about American, the American Revolution in your American history class. Um, 
you know, they're a little bit outside of this project, but I just wanted you to see the connection between the Enlightenment and the American and French revolutions and, and where we're going. Right? Um, you know, the American Revolution, right? These older English colonies in North America, they didn't really think that English control was okay. Um, you know, they had these conflicts over taxation, which is kind of funny because the American colonies weren't taxed that high. They weren't as taxed as high as, you know, other places around the world. Um, but they also didn't have representation in the English Parliament, and so there was a lot of anger with, you know, why are we paying taxes if we don't have the freedom to choose our own leaders? Um, and again, there's that Enlightenment idea again. Um, you know, also the colonies were becoming wealthier, and they felt more powerful. They felt they could do what they wanted to do. Um, you know, and this all comes out in the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, these beliefs in individual choice and freedom, those are represented in the Declaration of Independence as well as the Constitution and the war itself. So, you know, you can see here how the Enlightenment leads to the American Revolution or the American Revolution is really a part of the Enlightenment. Same thing with the French Revolution, right? Traditionally, France was organized into three estates, the church, the nobility, and the workers. And the workers rebelled against what they saw as collusion between the other two states. They felt that, you know, the church and the nobility were ganging up on them and working together to kind of hold the people down. And so they rebelled. They, you know, they stormed the Bastille and took over Paris and eventually France. Um, and, you know, and they executed uh, Louis the Sixteenth. Um, you know, and their motto here, the motto of the revolution, I think it's still the national motto of France, right? Liberty, equality, and fraternity, right? Fraternity is brotherhood. These are, you know, very enlightenment ideas that everyone should have liberty and equality and, and brotherhood. Uh, that simply would not have happened before this time period. All right, so that's it. Good job. And this completes our look at the transformation of Europe between 1500 and 1800. And, you know, going away from this, I want you to consider what, you, you know, whether you think that science is more important th than faith and whether you think the Enlightenment has made the world better. Maybe you don't think that uh, we should have this much freedom and democracy. Or maybe you do think that, you know, people should be in charge and tell other people what to do. Um, you know, something to think about. Um, like I said, I certainly think the Enlightenment is a great thing, but... You have to decide for yourself. And so connect this to the lesson on the Renaissance uh, in order to complete your DBQ.